And I am excited because Andy, not only did we talk about food, but we also got to talk about the message. And he's got an awesome message tonight. But before he gets up here, we get a chance before we hear and learn more about God. We get to praise God and worship God. And we've got an awesome worship team going to be leading us. And as soon as they're done, we've got stuff in the back for the kids. Uh, we've got a special guest speaker coming, Mr. Dave. So kids, once the worship is done, you guys can head back there. But as we get ready, I am, I am excited. Let's, let's just pray to the Lord and lift up hands. Let's pray. Dear God, as we come right now, thank you. Thank you for being our God. And thank you, Lord, for turning graves into graves. And we talked about transformation. And I pray, Lord, that as we come to your house tonight, Come here ready to worship you. Lord, we want to just bring all our focus to you. Any graves we have, we want to hand over to you. Any struggles we're dealing with, we hand them over to you tonight, Lord, so that we can hear what you've got planned for us, what you're going to do. And Lord, we come ready to worship you because you are so good. Thank you, Lord. We're going to ask now that you guys stand up. I'm excited because the worship team tonight is our very own Jesse and Brittany. They are, they, they look cute together up there because they're married. So.
in Spain, and they're making it white as snow. And um, they're doing this, this is one of my favorite songs called Come Thou Fount. And some of the words are, I was lost in utter darkness, but he came and rescued you. And now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. For your grace is always with me and I'll never be alone. So I really, if you're not a singer, like you're a dancer, that's even better. But um, just both the song, these words really meditate on them. And that's the reason why we picked them so much. Um, not just because we can celebrate and live by Jesus, but we can look to what I, what he did for us.
That was great. Um, you know, um, both nights of worship, I think, were awesome. I, Some people, I like bands, but I like that stuff, too. I like the simpler acoustic stuff, and uh, thank you for leading. That was cool. Um, uh, tonight, we have actually a handout because um, I have 32 points, and uh, so I want to make sure, <laughs> literally, literally, I have 32 points. 27 of them I'm hoping to accomplish in about six minutes. But you're probably not going to be able to take notes on 27 points in six minutes, so I'm giving them to you. Uh, I think there's a blank slide on the back if there's anything else for me to say on my last five. This so happens to be five again at the end. No, last week, last night we had five. I, well, I'm not doing that on purpose just to irritate you that think that all the preachers do have three points. <laughs> um, in fact, my wife does sermon slides for me along with another lady. She takes a turn doing the sermon slides. And there are many nights I don't have any, many sermons, I don't have any points. <laughs> I don't highlight any. I just, we do scripture and we take lessons from the scripture as we go. And she goes, oh, you don't have any points again today, huh? <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, but hopefully God will direct something from the scripture and you'll get something out of it. Um, these 27, actually there were around 25 of them about 14 years ago. Um, I was a minister at Cougar Christian Church and... We had a sunrise service, and I presented 25 things that Jesus overcame death while he was on earth, how he avoided it. Because um, last night we talked about the fact that Jesus is the only one that can turn graves into gardens, and tonight that Jesus turned every grave into a garden while he was here. That he doesn't lose anyone. None of his sheep, if one goes astray, he goes and gets them and brings them back. And so... Tonight, it's going to be easier for you to have that handout just to help us do those first 27 points. So you can say you survived in about 33 minutes, 32 points, because I just wasted a minute. So there we go. So we're going to look at the scriptures in the gospel where Jesus dealt with death and what happened. By the way, I told you 25 then. I've added seven since then. And seriously, if I do not mention a time that Jesus avoided death in the gospels, please let me know. I'm adding to the list. I'm sure a few years from now, we'll be up to 35, okay, as we keep searching. Um, there's no easy way on Scripture. Um, I have two men's groups that I lead. Uh, six of these men, they're college-aged men, 
Uh, actually, one just graduated. He's an engineer. We think we're going to lose him because he moved out of town. And the other four men are all between the age of 27 and 29. They're all married and have one plus children. And these four men and these six men, we meet separate, and we go through a study together. And I tell them often, guys, you're going to have to get in the Word and start reading. Because if you're not reading, you're never going to know the answers that God already has to all your prayers are right here in His Word. And it just takes time. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. People want answers and they want shortcuts. You know, we did it, we did it, take this is extra. We did it, Joey, I wasn't supposed to do this till late in the week, but Joey says, we did a take the three challenge where I'm at now two years in a row. And it's the first time, this was just a few years ago, it's the first time my wife and I ever read scripture together for a whole year. First time ever. Now, we did some devotions, but we usually got stuck in the mud part of the way through the year. But we did take the three challenge, and we had about 150 people that signed up for it. They committed to reading three chapters a day in the New Testament, and they would get through the New Testament four times in one year. And we did that two years in a row, my wife and I did. Now, to show you that Jesus has the answers, guess what the first book of the New Testament is about? Matthew, Jesus. What's the second book of the New Testament about? Are we going to move on to Paul? No, let's stay with Jesus. What about the third book? What about the fourth book? Well, it's four times more important to find out about what's going on with Jesus than the rest of it. So four times, we read through four times the whole New Testament, 16 times the life of Jesus in year one, 16 times the life of Jesus in year two. And then there were two other years that I did five times through. That's a lot of times through. And then we took an app one year and we read through because we never read the Bible on the phones. I don't like doing that. But we forced ourselves to learn technology and we read through the whole Bible together. All I can say is you don't have to do it on your own. You can get somebody else and read it with you. But if you're not going to study it, you're not going to know it. And I'm here to tell you, I am literally one of the, I don't, I don't mean, I'm not saying, I, I'm, I'm a, relatively, I'm not that bright. Seriously, I have to read it. <laughs> There's my secretary of 21 years, <laughs> and she's laughing. <laughs> she knows. She knows. But really, I have to repeat and keep reading. Some people, I mean, some of you are brilliant, and you can just get it. No, you can't. The Word of God is living and active, and you've got to stay in it. I don't care if you're an Einstein. So I challenge you to get in the Word. Now, that was an additional three and a half minutes. Sorry about that, Joey. Um, but you need to stay after for the afterglow because my goal is for this, for me personally, to be a 12-pound revival by the time we get done. Okay. Let's go through the list. Jesus turned every grave into, gar grave into garden. I'm going to read Matthew 1. Joseph could have had Mary stoned to death. Well, Mary stoned to death for having a child out of wedlock. There goes Jesus. Time to give birth, and there's no room in the end. Uh-oh. No room to have a baby? You could lose the baby. Matthew 2, Herod is killing the babies in Bethlehem while Jesus is carried off to Egypt. Either one of those could be bad. Joseph and Mary found Jesus in the temple after missing him for three days. How many 12-year-olds do you have would be missing for three days in a bustling town and still be alive three days later? Not very many. Do you realize that the three temptations of Jesus, so he could have avoided the cross, came? And do you know when he said, throw yourself off the pinnacle? Yeah, he knows that angels are going, but maybe angels wouldn't do that. Maybe he jumps off the pinnacle and splat. There goes Jesus. But he said no to that temptation. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, two times he overturned the money tables. We'll mention something about that later tonight. John 4, the Pharisees heard that Jesus' ministry was growing faster than John the Baptist. John 4, the first three verses. In fact, it says he wasn't baptizing people, but his disciples were baptizing more people than John the Baptist. And then mysteriously, it says he left the area because the Pharisees knew that John the Baptist wasn't the biggest target anymore. Jesus was. So he leaves because he's a target. And if the target leaves, you can't hit it, right? He avoided death, maybe. Matthew chapter 12, verse 16, it says he healed them all. Mark chapter 5, it says that more than just once, by the way. Mark chapter 5, Jesus healed a demon possessed man who couldn't be chained. If this guy can't be chained and he's coming towards you, you better cast something out or you're in trouble. John chapter 8 tells the story of a woman caught in adultery. Jesus saves her from being stoned because they said he was perfect, cast the first stone. 
Matthew chapter 20. No wonder they couldn't believe that Jesus would actually die. Do you know later on toward the end of his ministry, Jesus told them plainly, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be put into the hands of these wicked people and I'm going to die. And they couldn't believe him. You know why they couldn't believe him? Because every time he faced death, he avoided it. Surely he's going to avoid his own death. Surely he's going to avoid his own death. Uh, where do we stop? Okay, uh, next section. Matthew 8. Um, also in Mark and Luke, the disciples were saved from drowning. Luke 14, Peter gets out of the boat. He starts to drown. They're all going to drown. He saves them. Okay, Mark chapter 8, the crowds need to be fed. The apostles were to go and raise the dead. We'll see more of that later as well. Jesus did whatever it took to defeat death even before the cross. And I'm sure he raised more people than just the three that are recorded. Do you know that it's only recorded that he actually raised three people from the dead? The first is Jairus' daughter. Matthew and Luke um, tell that story as well. Then the second is John 11 tells of Lazarus, one of his best friends. Remember it says Jesus wept and he brought him back to life. And by the way, at the end of John 11, they're really plotting to kill Jesus. I didn't put the third one here because that's one of my final thoughts. So it'll be point 28 through 30, 28 through 30, yeah, 32. So we'll get to that. I don't know what we're up to now, but we're getting close. Even during Jesus' final few days, Death was defeated many times. Maybe Jesus was trying to save Judas by giving him a warning and saying, go ahead, you're going to do this and come what you've come to do. Um, there's a possibility. He also tells Peter and the others that they will scatter to save them. Because if they just scatter and leave him, they could become like Judas and take their own lives. He tells them all because he wants to save them and get them out of there so they are not killed right after he's arrested. I believe he's orchestrating all this. God is working. Uh, thieves on the cross, I mentioned this too. I mean, the thieves on the cross, they weren't physically saved, but one of them, today you will be with me in paradise. And then right after his death, well, this could be a, more, many more people. They came out of the grave. Remember that? We don't usually have it in our passion plays. In the old days, we didn't have too many zombies coming out, but occasionally you'll see a church that really knows what the Bible says. You'll have some zombies get up right by the cross, and people go, what is this, you know? Night of the living dead? No, it's scriptural. Dead people came back alive and, and so forth. And so, and, oh, by the way, I put one of the resurrection passages right there. Death could not keep him. So that's your list. And even though the author of life, Jesus Christ, faced death many times, he stayed true to his mission right to the end. Because I think even in his death, his one goal on the cross was to win many people to Christ. And he won a thief for him. Um, now, before we get to the next one, and actually the next one is actually supposed to be my number 27, and then we'll get to our final five. Before we get to that one, I want to say something about the apostles. <clears throat> this is the hard thing about going and speaking at another church, because you have a lot of sermons in mind, and, <laughs> and I just preached one on Matthew. We're doing a series on the apostles this summer. I've never done a series of, I'm reading two books that are helping with that, and I've never done a series on the apostles. I'm here to tell you I can't list, there's three or four of their names, I don't, I don't remember. There's nothing, absolutely nothing written about them. They don't say anything or nothing. Even Matthew, we're talking this week, Matthew writes 28 chapters and he only puts himself in there by when he left his, when he left his franchise. You know, they bought franchises, tax collectors bought from Caesar, franchise, like owning a restaurant, and you own your tax booth, right? So you're pretty wealthy and you got a franchise. He left it. But that's the only thing that he writes except for his list of apostles. There's nothing else about him. But anyway, that's free stuff. But notice, in, it is not until Matthew 10 or Luke 6 that Jesus officially calls the apostles. The 12 apostles are not the 12 apostles until 18 months into Jesus' ministry. And then the last 18 months they got to kind of go into hiding. And you can't do that with 70 to 120 people. It's too large of a disciple group. So he chose from among that group 12. Now, <clears throat> you know that Matthew was not called an apostle or a disciple of Jesus until Matthew 9. If he didn't leave his tax booth till Matthew 9, there's no way he was there at the Sermon on the Mount. Or we assume if he was, he were of the, of the greater group and kind of hiding as a hidden disciple. So let, let's review this real quick. In John chapter 1, you can check this out on your own. In John chapter 1, the first two apostles that are called are Andrew and we think John. 
Andrew's the one that's named. John never names himself when he writes the book of John. Now, when he gets to Revelation, he's a little over that, and he starts naming himself quite a bit. But in John, he's the disciple whom Jesus loved. He never... So Andrew and John are disciples of John the Baptist, it says. And when John the Baptist sees Jesus, says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he's talking to him and says, Hey, you ought to follow him. He's the Messiah. They leave him, John the Baptist, and Andrew and John become the first two disciples or the first two of the 12 final apostles. They become the first two. Andrew goes and gets his brother Peter, all in John 1. And then Jesus goes and finds Philip and says, Come follow me. And Philip goes and gets his best friend, we think, Nathaniel. They call him Nathaniel and John. And the rest of the books, they call him Bartholomew. See how confusing the apostle thing is? It's very confusing. And that's why I've never done a series on it and probably never will again. <laughs> but anyway, so now we have five apostles or disciples that are going to be apostles in John 1. Those five go with Jesus to John 2 to the first uh, the wedding feast of Cana. We know that Matthew's not there. He's not kept there for Matthew 9, right? So they might maybe do a little preaching tour. At the end of John 2, Jesus overturns the tables in his first year of ministry. He also does that right before they crucify him. So I don't know when he overthrew them if those five, their nostrils got cleared and they said, what role? We better go home for a while. But disciples of people did not follow them 24-7. They listened to him teach. They go to revival. They go home and fish. And that's what they did. So next, we find them in Matthew 4 where Jesus comes along the sea. And he says, hey, Peter and Andrew, I know you're fishing. Why don't you come fish for men? Come follow me. And they leave their nets and follow him. And then we find that John and James, come follow me, leave your nets. And so now he's building his group. Now, turn with me to Luke chapter 6. This is about 18 months. This is the same as Matthew 10. It's just the equivalent passage. About 18 months into Jesus' ministry, he finally calls, officially calls the apostles. And... Um, Notice why he calls them. There's a little hint here. Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 11 through 13. But, uh, okay, okay. Here, um, let me mention real quick. Starting at chapter 5, verse 17, one day when he was teaching, Pharisees, teachers of the law, who had come from every village, they came and they were sitting there, and, and, and Jesus was doing great things, and they started opposing him. So I want you to know that things started to happen bad when the religious leaders came from all over. You know that religious leaders don't come from all over the synagogue just by happenstance. They're all there to do something and see what's going on with this Jesus, right? More people are going to him than John the Baptist. That's part of the reason he left the area earlier, and now they're coming to see what's going on. And if you read, there are five or six vignettes here where they're a pain. I can't believe you're doing this on the Sabbath. I can't believe this. So now we're down to Luke 6, verse 11. But they were furious and began discussing with another what they might do to Jesus. Mark 3, 6 says they wanted to destroy him. They're wanting to kill him, Okay. So what's my plan now? I have 70 to 120 disciples. It's hard for a group of 120 to, to hide as we're going across the plain running from the authorities. So we better, we better pare our group down a little bit. The greater group of disciples can join us when we have thousands because we're protected by the crowds then. They dare not do something then. And so... What does Jesus do in verse 12? This is Luke 6, verse 12. One of those days, Jesus went up the mountainside to pray. He spent the whole night praying. Why is he praying all night? Because he's picking his apostles now. Notice what it says in verse 13. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, or 12 from among them. So among the 70, we don't know if it's 120. It could be 500. He picks 12. Not everyone makes the final cut. Sorry. It's like trying out for a team. Didn't make it. Well, nobody really knew there was going to be a cut. But Jesus chose 12 from among them, and then he names them right there. But notice, now I, have, I'm, it's, 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 um, I, I like the wording better in Matthew. Notice right after he picks them in Matthew 10 what he tells them to do. And I know I'm spending too much time on the disciples, stuff, but I thought it was important to tell you that he's even, I think he's protecting his apostles here, and he's saving them. They're closing in on Jesus, and he doesn't want all 170 of them to be slaughtered by a huge group of soldiers. So he figures, I'm going to save them, send them back home. They can come back and join us occasionally. But us 12, we're, we got to go on a tour. I only have 18 months left. And I need to pour my life into these 12 24-7 from now on. 
Um, but in Matthew 10, right after he chooses them, look what it says in verses 7 and 8. He tells them, as you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, free to receive, free to give. Raise the dead. How many, did, how many people did the apostles raise the dead? When they went out on their tours, and when the larger group went out on their tours later, I think they raised many people from the dead, not recorded in the book. Jesus told them to go and raise the dead. Do you think they didn't raise the dead? Well, no, they did. So there Jesus is saving his apostles, saving his greater group of disciples by sending them home, and going into hiding with the ones he's chosen to be the final twelve. Um, so, too long. Okay, number one. <laughs> and now we get to the final five. Whew, boy, what time? Oh my goodness, that took way too long. Everybody go, oh no, we're in trouble. Just say it real quick. Oh no, we're in trouble. Oh, trouble, trouble, trouble. Whew, that's okay though. Um, yeah, we can, we can do the, what's that thing afterwards called? Oh, afterglow. Okay. We used to call it linger longer. Linger longer. Do you remember? Do, do, is that not afterglow? Did, did they used to call it linger longer here, or was that somewhere? No, oh, we just said. Well, what now? Okay. <laughs> All right. Look for it. That, this is crowd participation night. Come on now. Okay. Um, the first story I want to tell you about to give you a little more detail about Jesus overcoming death is in Luke chapter 4. And it's overcoming his own death early on. And uh, he is going to his own town in verse 14, and he's becoming pretty famous. He taught in their synagogues. But he, when he went to his hometown synagogue, he happened to come in on Sabbath day when they were reading Isaiah about him. Don't think that that's coincidence. They did lectionary reading, many of the synagogues, and they would take two to three years to get through the whole Old Testament. And it just so happens that during that three years of reading, Jesus comes in on the day that they're reading about what he will do in his ministry. And so to kick off his ministry, so to speak, in his hometown, which he knew he wouldn't be accepted there, he reads from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. That's in verse 18 of Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll. Do you know what happens when you drop the mic? This is what he basically did. He didn't drop the scroll, but he pretty much it's a drop of the mic situation. He rolls up the scroll. He gave it back to the tenant. He sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And look at all spoke well of him. They spoke well of him, and then things started to turn a little bit. Right in the middle of being impressed, Mark kind of says this better. He adds that the crowd asked, I know we're all impressed with him and stuff, and he's a great reader and a teacher, and he's done these. Isn't this uh, Mary's son? Now, what do you think they're insinuating when it says, isn't this Mary's son? Is this an illegitimate son that we? some people are starting to whisper that he's the Messiah? Well, Jesus doesn't really like that, and so he wants to talk about some teaching. And they want some proof, by the way. So prove to us you can't be the Messiah. Prove to us, show us a miracle. And so Jesus will now point out what God's plan has been all along, that what he just read, we're going to help everyone, no matter who they are, no matter if they're not part of the family of God. We're going to help everyone that needs help. And then he turned, look, look at Luke uh, chapter 4, verse 25. Uh, pro, the prophet is not accepted, you know, in his own town. 25, this is Luke 4. I assure you there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine through the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of those Jewish widows, but to a widow of Zarephath, a Gentile widow. He's getting them right now. He's kind of getting them back to Scripture. Okay? Preachers shouldn't do that, but Jesus has the right to do that. So. Um, and there were many in Israel who had leprosy in the time, but who did he go to? Did he heal somebody of leprosy? A Jew? Nope. A Gentile. 
In fact, Naaman from Syria, Assyrian. And, <laughs> and by the way, do you know that the lowest people on their ladder were women, lepers, and Gentiles? And do you know who Jesus said that Elijah and Elisha, the greatest prophets, they thought almost had ever lived, who they helped? They didn't help any Jews. A woman and a man, leper, Gentile. Whew. And this explains their response. All the people, verse 28, in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town. They took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. He walked right through their midst and went on his way. You think you can, you think you can kill Jesus? You think you can get him with death? You can't do it. Number two on our list, this is much shorter. The reason I added this one as number two, it's in John chapter 8, is because I just added this on the list within the last six months. I figured I'm going to show you my latest one that I found. I cannot believe I didn't see this. When I read it again, I thought, oh my goodness, how many times have I read the New Testament? Duh, how did you miss this? Really, I was saying that, duh. And, and so, anyway, that's the way it goes. Um, John 8, 37. Um, I know that you're Abraham's descendants, yet you're ready to kill me. Jesus is saying, you guys are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. But they weren't just thinking about killing him. Turn to verse 59, the very last verse of that chapter. As at this, they picked up stones to stone Jesus, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away through the temple grounds. They're picking up stones to kill Jesus, and he's gone. He's not going to die until it's time for him to die. You know, It's not going to happen. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, remember the John account of the Garden of Gethsemane? This is a free one. This will be six. I'm not going to look at it because I don't even know where to find it right now. But John's account. You remember, you remember John's account? Do you remember when the cohort and the soldiers, almost 600 people came after Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? And Jesus said, I am. And it says in John, they all fell down. When 600 soldiers fall down at your word, a million soldiers aren't going to be able to put you on a cross unless you want to go on a cross, and there's a reason why you're going to die. So other people's graves can become gardens. Okay, number four, which is my number three, of six now instead of five, if you're counting. This widow's son at name. I want to, this is a short one, but I want to read it verse by verse. Um, in fact, I think this one touches me the most because I can't believe what Jesus did here. This is one of those three that Jesus raised from the dead while he was on the earth. Listen to Luke chapter 7, verse 11, and we're going to go verse by verse. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. Most ancient manuscripts say they went to Nain the very next day, and that's 20 miles. And in one day, this big crowd went 20 miles. You have to wonder around mile 10, what are we doing? Seriously, mile 12, mile 14. We haven't healed anybody, no sermons, no nothing. And you get to mile 20, and you get to verse 12. Luke 7, verse 12. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from town was with her. We have a huge crowd following Jesus 20 miles in one night, in one day, and we have a huge crowd that has a dead person that's walking this way, and they just so happen to hit the gate at the right time. Two groups, one rejoicing and thinking about Jesus' victories and wondering why they're walking 20 miles to a town that's never mentioned in Scripture, only this once. Why are we here? Do you remember any stories? No, there's nothing in name. What's name? And I don't know. I have no idea why we're here. And he, the only begotten son of this widow met God's only begotten son. The death of a young person is tragic. It's one thing to bury a child. It's another thing to bury a child when your spouse is gone. Because you have nothing. It's your only child. You have nothing to live on. You have no hope. 
And then verse 13. As the hopelessness sets in, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. And don't you think that this is the first time that Jesus saw her. Apparently she was crying out, and God said, my son, you came to this earth for this woman, and you need to take that group 20 miles one way to bring her son back to life. And that's exactly what happened. And by the way, Luke mentions widows six times in Luke and two times in Acts because God cares for everyone, especially widows that are hurting and struggling over the loss of the love of their life. He cares. And then look at the end of the story, 14 to 16. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. And by the way, I don't think this was Jesus' crowd that was saying this, although they were amazed. I think Jesus was teaching them a lesson. We don't have to do a thousand miracles in a day to make it a successful day. We just need to reach one person. Because you're not going to reach a thousand a day, normally. And that town came to know Jesus. Number four or five, or five or six, depending on where we are, is John 18. Is Peter possibly saved by denying Jesus? Jesus told him that he would do it, so when the rooster crows, he would leave and be saved. That's the theory. Remember that Peter was in the courtyard because his rich friend John, son of Zebedee, they were probably richer because they kept talking about Zebedee, 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 um, they were richer, and they had a connection with the high priest. So John got Peter into the courtyard. The other ten weren't there. And so Peter is watching from a distance, warming himself by a fire, when Jesus already told him he'd deny him three times, when he starts to deny him. But Jesus does not want him to fail. He wants him to not deny him. But he tells him he's going to because he doesn't want him to be crushed. He wants to... Look him in the eye, and he wants Peter to get out and be saved and not be killed. Okay, um, look with me to Mark chapter 14, just three verses here, and then we're on to our final one. Wait, we made it. Whew. Okay, suffering is almost over. Mark 14, and if you linger longer, we'll be able to, it'll be great for us to linger longer together. Mark 14, verse 30. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice. You yourself will disown me three times. What do you mean the rooster crowed twice? Turn to verse 68. This is of Mark 14, 68. This is after Peter denies him the first time. And here's what happens. But he denied it. He says, you're Nazarene. He denied it. I don't know. Understand what you're talking about. He said, and he went out into the entryway. That was after the first one. After the third denial, look at verse 72, immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Pause. When did the rooster crow the first time in this story? Verse 68. And you'll see a note in your Bible that most of the early manuscripts actually say, and it does actually say this in the Greek, and he went outside into the forecourt and the rooster crowed. So right after Peter denies him the first time, a rooster crows... So Peter will quit denying him right then. Because what did he say before the rooster crows twice? You will deny me three times. So when he denies him the first time, the rooster crows to warn him. This should, this should trigger your memory, Peter. Stop right now, Peter. Stop right now. Um, but it doesn't trigger his memory or he's going to continue to deny. And then if you read the rest of verse 72, immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. And then the final one, just a page over from this, Mark 15, 15. Now I'm going to jump around a couple times on this one, but this is, it's about Barabbas. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate reached Barabbas to them. By the way, this is five of five or six of six for those that are counting. Okay, here we go. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Barabbas was released. Jesus took his place. So, so not only did he win the thief on the cross, he took the middle cross, 
which was Barabbas's cross, and his two lieutenants were probably the other two that were killed. You killed some of the major leaders. Another good reason for Jesus to say, hey, you, my main leaders, the prophets, you're all going to flee when this happens. Because he kind of wants them to flee. He doesn't want them all gathered up and killed the same night he's killed, right? Strategic, smart, good thinking. So look at Luke 23. This gives the same story, but look at how they try to release Jesus. Luke 23, 18 through 22. With one voice they cried, Array with this man and release Barabbas. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then released. Over and over and over. Herod, hey, there's nothing wrong with Pilate. There's nothing wrong. Even Judas goes back and says, there's nothing wrong. You sh he shouldn't be killed. I betrayed an innocent man. Here's your money. Witness after witness after witness. You need two to three witnesses to kill somebody. But if you have two to three witnesses to say they're innocent and they're as great as Pilate and Herod, you should listen to them. But these religious leaders were bent on killing him. And the only time in Jesus' ministry that he lost is when he won for us. He himself died so we could live. And he took the place of Barabbas. I'm convinced that was Barabbas' cross. And in fact, they, they went on and preached about it in the early church. They pointed it out. Um, this is uh, this last passage. Um, please stand for this. We'll, we'll read this together and then we'll close. Acts 3.13. <laughs> the preacher says we're about ready to close. <laughs> you know how much weight that uh, carries. Um, Acts 3.13 the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let them go. Yeah, Pilate tried to keep letting them go. Herod didn't want him to do it either. You disowned the holy and righteous one, and you asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life for a murderer? And there's, some, there's something there in the language. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. Jesus took the middle cross. I know you know what happened. Because that day, the true Barabbas did die on that middle cross. Bar means son of. Abba means father. Bar Abba. The earthly son of the father got to go free. The heavenly son of the father stayed on a tree. For you and for me. The only time that he seemed to drop the ball on death was when he freed us all from death. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Father, we're amazed that I have so many lists of this stuff, and I know it's too much material. It's like we're in high school or college class again, and I know it makes me nervous because I don't like tests and and, but God, it's amazing to me how often you overcame death through your son and how you will always overcome death through him. There's no victory or sting in death anymore because of your son, Jesus, and we worship and praise you because of that. And God, I, I pray for a blessing as we come to this decision time. Um, maybe there are some here that have not really thought about their own death enough yet that they've prepared for it. I just pray that if there's anyone here that needs your son Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that they'll come forward as we sing. And Father, if they're not going to come forward, they'll, they'll say something to Joey or myself or someone tonight so we can start that path to them. <laughs> Actually, we'll bring them to you through your son who is the path, the way, the truth, and the life. So Father, uh, help us to be dedicated um, and, and keep reaching out to people that so need this good news. We love you and we praise you, God. We praise you that you took our cross. And we will never take that for granted in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you have a decision to make, I need encourage you to come forward. Joey, um, the minister here, and Jesse, he's an associate, right? Associate here. Uh, but.
come, come as they sing, and Joey will, would love to pray with you. Um, and for a lot of times I know we make decisions just standing, and that's good. Or maybe if you have not got to that point yet where you're reading God's Word that much, I, I just encourage you to start sometime. I know here at Covington they're starting a reading thing this Sunday, right? So jump in there. Just jump in. If, if you go to another church, just start reading. You know, do Find something to do in reading. Um, Jump in it, and, 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 and maybe with somebody else, because it kind of helps me. We're behind a few days. I'm a checklist person. If I get behind two days, I'm miserable. Now we got to read three days' worth, but we do, because I don't want to read four days' worth tomorrow. So set a goal, and I just encourage you to say it. So maybe you just need to recommit to that tonight. But I encourage you to make a decision as we sing and as we worship.
something keeps coming up. We talked last night about different ages of people whose graves were shown to Columbus. But tonight he went through and he listed off different people of different backgrounds. People whose backgrounds, some of them were hurting, some of them were doing good, some of them were doing evil, and some of them were very, very evil. I mean, the Barabbas dude was a bad, bad dude. There's a reason why he was getting hung up on the cross. And yet, God sent Jesus to turn all of their failings on. And when I hear that, it's encouraging to me, and I want to pass that on to all of you and just stress this. Where you are now, Jesus wants to change you and change that going right now. He's ready to. I want to encourage you if there's something and it's on your heart, feel free to come to. We, we had everyone stand up last night. Sure. Reach out to one of us. Come to us. Talk to us. We would love to pray with you. Even if it's during the day, me and Andy are over here. Or if you look at one of the restaurants, you'll find us in one of those. <laughs> <We're not laughs> us. But what I encourage you to do is come and, come and talk to us. Sit down with us. We would love to talk to you. Even if we are eating. Pull up a chair. We talking with you is more important than even eating for us. But I want you to know that. That God loves you that much no matter what you've done, where you've been. Also, we talk about it, talking and eating. We are doing an afterglow afterwards. Uh, we're going to sing another song here in a second. And we want to invite everybody to come on back and to talk. And I encourage you, talk and fellowship. But also, if there's something that stuck out to you tonight, whether it's one of the worship songs, whether it's something Andy said, talk about that too. You don't just have to talk about how the corn is growing or how great the dinner was or how good the little finger sandwiches taste. Tell the ladies it tasted good because it does. I know they always gave you that. But also talk about what God is doing in your life throughout this week so far. It's an opportunity to do that and to fellowship will let's let's remain standing and we're gonna sing one more song.